Welcome back to Dermcast TV. Rob Cascale in Miami, Florida, and we're here with a local girl. We're going to be talking to Ely Samuels today, who is a local uh, expert in, in cosmetic injections, and we're going to get some bullets from her today. Welcome to the studio today, Ely. It's Thank good to see you. Thank you. So good to be back. Yeah, and we uh, it, it's your support of the SCPA and, and your outreach to PAs and, and lecturing about cosmetics. It's 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 fantastic. Thank um, you. I had an opportunity to watch your lecture a little bit today. So we're going to uh, focus on some very practical information for folks that are already injecting, maybe thinking about injecting, and uh, hopefully, again, um, we can get inspire some people to, to, to be uh, rock stars like you. Oh, yourself. So, so uh, we'll start with um, probably one of the things that's most commonly done in cosmetics now is, uh, is botulinum toxin. Okay, so let's start by you. Give me, and this can be an hour lecture alone, yeah. evaluation of the face cosmetically for toxin. So give me th three bullets on what you will do in terms of evaluating some, somebody for toxin. All right, so the first thing that I insist on is that my patients wash their face with soap and water. So they have to go over a sink, use facial cleanser, and get all that makeup and everything that they have off of their face. Because when you're evaluating a patient, you can't do a proper assessment through makeup. It's really important that you're looking at their freshly washed yeah. face. And it, it seems kind of obvious, but I mean, sometimes it gets yeah. forgotten. Right? Exactly. Okay. And then it also lends into doing proper aseptic technique because you don't want to be injecting through any sort of makeup or any dirt that they have on their face in that way that you're decreasing their risks of having any, um, you know, adverse outcomes of any infections or you can even tattoo somebody um, if they have some makeup on their face with the needle. So it's really important to have a freshly washed face and I really insist on it with my patients. Great. Another thing that I think is very important is taking a really good uh, patient history. Um, you know, the usual medical history, allergies, everything, but also asking them about past cosmetic experiences. Because if you ask, they might tell you, oh, I once went to an injector and they dropped my brow. And then that's something that I want to know. It could have been technique, it could have been poor product placement, um, it could have just been their anatomy and they're just not a good candidate. And that would you know, kind of lend itself to telling me how careful and, um, uh, you know, the way I would approach that patient. So I think understanding their cosmetic and aesthetic history along with everything else that we ask them is really important. And that'll sort of um, shape the way I approach them when I'm injecting. Um, lastly is animation. Super important to have your patients animate. You want to look at them not only at rest, but you want them frowning, smiling. Um, I also want them to lift up their eyebrows. I want them to purse their lips. Um, I also have them uh, tilt their head down so I can, and that's more also for um, symmetry and evaluating uh, for possible filler treatments. But you know, when someone puts their, ch their chin to their chest, you can kind of um, see the symmetry between the apples of their cheek and the different sides of their face. And also I'll have them raise their brows while they have their chin to their chest. And that'll also told, show me how much they are using their frontalis muscle and how much muscle activation they're having and how dependent they are on their frontalis muscle to let me know, is it okay for me to relax that or are they going to need that muscle to keep their eyes open? So these are all things that I kind of do without them even realizing. Um, sometimes I just watch them while I'm just talking to them and asking them you know, what they do for a living and, and how many kids they have. And I walk around the room as well as I'm talking to them. I want to see them in different lights. I wanted to see them at different angles. And that all of that goes into my patient uh, facial assessment. That's great. So let me pick this apart because sure. I've never heard that trick about uh, yeah. flexing your neck, mm -hmm. raising your eyebrows. Explain that a little yeah. more detail just, just for the Sure, viewers. I can even show them. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, so um, you ask your patient to put their chin to their chest and without moving look up at you. So, and you watch to see how much they're using their frontalis muscle to look up at you. And if you see that they're using their frontalis muscle quite a bit and they already have some heavy brows, you might want to take caution with that patient and maybe choose not to inject the, right. um, the frontalis or you might say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do a very conservative dose on you. I can always put more in. I always tell my patients, I can put more in, I can't take out. Right. So I'd rather do a little bit, bring you back in a couple weeks, see what else you need. Once I figure out your dose, then you know expect it to be a one visit 
um, right. experience. But the first time I'm injecting patients, I tell them they need to look at it as a two-visit uh, you know, treatment. Great. So that the premise there is that uh, they're, they're flexing their neck, and in order to get the ocular movement to look at you, if they engage their frontalis, they're probably pretty dependent yeah. on it, so you got to watch how much you're Exactly. So okay. if you look Fantastic. when I do it, I'm, I'm using it just a little bit. Right, okay. but there's some people that you see they can they just are using their entire frontalis and the entire area yeah. to keep their eyes open. Okay. And if they're very dependent, that might be one of the tools we have as a screening. Okay, not an absolute thing, but a screening that maybe you need to be a little cautious. Okay, so let's do it on me. Okay, I, and this is you have this any toxins in your face? No. Okay. <laughs> the only thing artificial in this body is my uh, cologne. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, so, and I'm, this is this is monumental, so I'm going to have okay. my wrinkles on camera now forever, okay. so, okay, right. so I'm going to flex my neck. Okay, so first okay. you're going to put your neck to your chest. Okay, maybe I'll face the camera sure. here. Sure. Okay. So put your neck to your chest. Okay. Okay, and without lifting your chin, mm -hmm. go ahead and lift up your eyes and look up. So, I mean, you're using it, but not that much. I mean, I think it would still, okay. I would still feel comfortable injecting what, you. All right, where are the grade of my right tits? Be, be gentle, <laughs> be gentle. Don't, don't answer that question on camera. Don't answer that question. Okay, so this is great. This is, yeah. that's a bullet I didn't know of. And so now yeah. hopefully um, our- Just one of the many tools that you can right. use and it's Fantastic. not absolute, but it's okay. a good way just to screen. So we could talk about injection techniques probably for another hour, but let's yeah. let's try to keep this practical. Sure. People always ask this question in your lecture, uh, several questions. So let's talk about how much toxin you use. Mm -hmm. And we'll, for, for simplification, we'll talk in Botox units because it's mm -hmm. just comments like, uh, sure. it's like speaking English, right? You know, sure. uh, in terms of units. So- um, the, um, Other companies would really not be happy. Here I know, that, don't but, be, okay. uh, I, will I, go use, along. I use them all, so <laughs> I use them all. So, um, but it's common language, yeah. so, and it's less confusing. So let's, we'll talk in Botox units. Okay. Um, so uh, frontalis. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so where, how many units is a typical, and let's let's just, uh, you can say maybe, uh, let's break it up a into range. male and female, or, yeah. you know, just because the anatomies differ, and just maybe in general what you would normally do a number of units. Yeah, I mean, it's not even so much male versus female, it's kind of like how, almost surface area, like mm -hmm. how big are their foreheads, because right. you can have some female patients that have really high foreheads, and mm -hmm. you need to cover the entire area. So um, I think it just really just depends. Um, you know, sometimes someone who has a teeny tiny forehead, um, maybe I'll do like six units. Mm -hmm. Someone who has already some heavy brows and I'm worried about um, what the outcome would be. Also, maybe I'll just start with six units. My usual dose is somewhere between 12 and 20, um, but um, I'm usually starting around 12 and seeing what happens and bringing them back after two weeks and then touching up if needed. And then after that, I'll know what their, what their you know, final dose is for future treatments. Um, but uh, I mean, I think when you're faced with a brand new patient that you're consulting for the first time, I think it's okay to be a little bit more on the conservative side because again, you can always add additional units and then you'll know for the future, but you can never take out. Absolutely. So if there's any question about hooded eyelids, heavy brows, tiny little foreheads, I think it's okay to under treat and have that conversation with them, warn them, because okay. you don't want them to go home after two weeks right. and be like I, don't like, I don't like my outcome. If you tell them like, you might not like this after two weeks and that's okay, I just want to do this in a little bit of a slower, um, okay. incremental way, right. they, they appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so that probably applies to every area, area. you inject. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just talk numbers again, Glabella. Okay. So I'm somewhere, again, between 12 and 20. Okay. Um, usually it's, it's 12 units. But okay. again, if I see somebody who doesn't really have a lot of movement in their glabella, and I'm really just treating their glabella to counteract the frontalis that has a lot of activation, then maybe I'll do a few min units less. Maybe okay. I'll go down to eight units. But in general, 12 units, um, and I also do a three-point injection. Three-point. Which, you know, some people do a five-point injection. So if so I'm doing five points, it would do, be more, but for a three-point okay. injection, 12 units. So three-point, you're so in the four, belly of the four, core. four, four. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. You're in the belly of each corrugator and in the belly and the of the corsaris. corsaris. And, okay. and I don't always do tails. If okay. I'm gonna do corrugator tails, then that would add on somewhere between another four to eight units, depending on okay. what I'm doing. Got it, okay, and crow's feet. A crow's feet, um, so usually I start off with 12, on each, um, on each side, so it gives me a total of 24 units. Okay. Um, but very often, again, um, depending on the age of the patient, depending on how strong their muscles are looking, I might 
you know, start with six units on each side right. and then go from there. Right. Um, also, you have to have conversations with your patients, specifically with crow's feet. It can sometimes change the way they look in pictures and when they smile, some patients don't like it. So I think it's um, totally reasonable to kind of cut the dose in half and f if this is the first time that they're using neurotoxins in the area and then go from there and just kind of play around in the beginning and then once you find their dose, then you know what to stick with. Great. But what's really cool on that point is that we have some newer toxins coming down the pipeline that can help us with that. Right. So um, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a oh, minute. Oh, okay, Because okay. it's very cool. All no, right. it's very cool, I, I think. And then uh, let's just do uh, two last areas that are, because sure. they're not as commonly treated and mm -hmm. they're a little bit newer, mm -hmm. uh, the masseter. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you doing there? So interesting, you should say the masseters are also um, hopefully going to be FDA approved very soon. Mm -hmm. Um, I do anywhere between, I would say, 16 to 24 units. Um, it's just easier to go by fours mm -hmm. um, for me, um, but uh, it's kind of going to depend. So examining the patient will have a lot to do with it. Okay. So and if I have them clench and I feel that they literally have like apples in their masseters that are hard, I'm going to do a full 24 units on each masseter. Great. Um, if I feel like it's it's not as bad, I might start with 16 and bring them back after two, three weeks, see if they've gotten relief from that, and then um, dose them appropriately from there. Great. Yeah. And platysmal bands? Platysmals, I usually do 12 units of Botox in each of the medial bands. Got it. Okay, fantastic. So a total of 24. Okay, great. So very practical stuff, you know, yeah. points of reference. We know that the evaluation is going to differ from yeah. person to person. All right, so and platysmals are also getting FDA approved soon as well. Right, the so data is there, which is the, great. Yeah, so yeah. then hopefully we will have like clear, um, you know, guidelines right. as to how it was done on an FDA trial, and we can then incorporate that into our practices. Great. So we're going to end toxins with this. There's the pitfalls, and there's a lot of them we could talk about. The things, bruising, pain, headache, these are the things we know happen. So let's talk specifically about ptosis. This is probably, um, you know, the most chided side effect because it's the, the one, one that, that scares all of yeah, us. Yeah, and yep. and, and uh, it happens. Yeah. So what are your um, what are your hints in terms of evaluating for that to avoid it, mm -hmm. uh, and and what you do to avoid that pitfall? Yeah. So I think we've already basically touched on that. So mm -hmm. um, having your patients animate looking at how much hooding they have for their lids, looking at if they have low-lying eyebrows, how dependent they are on their frontalis muscle, um, and um, dosing appropriately. Okay. And, okay, go ahead. So, yeah, yeah so that's, those are all important. So let's talk specifically about mm -hmm. technique. Yeah. Let's say you have somebody with a prominent epicanthal fold, you know, um, mm -hmm. like, like I do, like most Asians do, for instance, because it's problematic. You get that, you know, that, but it's not true tosis, right? It's just you sort of relax their epicanthal fold and it, it just sort of falls and they're, it's not really their whole eyebrow um, mm -hmm. or their whole eyelid dropping. So do you, are you injecting less? Are you injecting only high? I mean, uh, so talk about that. Combination, yeah, yeah, both. Okay. So, you know, the higher you go, um, the safer you will be, right? Mm -hmm. So I usually say my rule is two finger breaths above the brow. You want to stay above that. Um, and, you know, a, doing a lighter dose to start off and then slowly, you know, bringing them back after two weeks and seeing how much more movement they have. And then you can kind of like pinpoint, okay, I want to do a little bit more here. I want to do a little bit more there. Um, the problem, you know, the pitfall of even doing that is that sometimes they can get a little bit of that, you know, eyebrow, weird what? Spock eye, yeah. whatever mm -hmm. people call it. So you have to warn them that they might have a little bit of movement on one side or have a little bit of a spocking of the brow, but don't worry, we will take care of that when you, you come back it. in two weeks. Okay. It's just, and it's just this time, just your initial treatment with me. I just want to be extra cautious. I'm, I'm the same way. So this is, the, these interviews are great because when I hear people's guidelines <laughs> and I'm doing the same thing, it, yeah. it, makes me, it makes me feel validated. So do you have any problem with injecting more laterally in the frontalis. Mm -hmm. So let's say beyond the mid pupillary line, the further you go laterally, this used to be looked at as uh, potentially yeah. problematic. Uh, do you have tr trouble with that? Not so much, but I usually don't need to go laterally. Mm. I'm just following patient's anatomy. And you ask them to lift their brows and you will see where they're pulling from, where that muscle yep. movement is. Right. And it's usually, it's not really that lateral, but in the few cases that it is, I think putting like one unit of Botox where you feel like you need to, I, I think that's okay as long as again, you're staying in that safe treatment zone and staying above um, that line of discretion. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. The other thing that I think that's very important when we're talking about brow heaviness and getting that fullness over in, in this area, 
Um, I personally will not treat a frontalis without treating a glabellar complex. Right. And I think that balance can also help with that issue because you're going to have a little bit of a softening of this muscle and by not relaxing the glabellar complex to right. counterbalance mm -hmm. and give you that little bit of an opening, yes. it'll look a little funny. So that's another thing I won't do. So make sure that you're treating your glabellar complex when you're doing a frontalis. Right. I agree totally, and yeah. at least partially. If they're against freezing it, exactly. put something in there to weaken exactly. it. Exactly, maybe just I, six units even, right. just something, because otherwise the cosmetic outcome, it'll be a little funny looking. That's great. So, and you mentioned earlier um, this concept of, you know, you have to evaluate people, put it in, and then you're, you're, you're if you if there's too much or an undesired effect, you're stuck for that average of 12 you weeks. Are. But maybe not so much anymore because there are some products out that work a little differently. Talk about this. Yes. A bit. So um, it has not yet been FDA approved, but we're super excited because it should be happening very soon. Um, Allergan is coming out with a new um, botulinum toxin. Um, type E. So the ones that are on, currently on the market are most commonly type A. So this is a different serotype of botulinum toxin. Um, so we're just calling it Bonti, um, but for botulinum toxin type E. And what's really cool about this product is it is going to have a really quick activation of about 24 hours. So it'll kick in in 24 hours and last somewhere around two, two weeks, maybe a month. Um, and that's wonderful for so right. many reasons. So right, for okay. So, so let's talk reasons. about that. Yeah. So you've got the people who are afraid to do mm -hmm. botulinum toxins. So mm -hmm. you have a very short consequence in terms yes. of time. Yes, That's it's one. wonderful. I call it the introductory drug to the introductory drug, right? Because right? it's the great way to get into cosmetics. Is the it's you well, know, yeah, it's toxin but no, they, but it's also yeah. for our patients that are scared. So market research they've right. shown us that what's holding people back from doing cosmetic procedures and toxins is that they're scared of looking unnatural and they're scared of having a bad outcome. So this is some sort of like a a, a fix for that. We're right. able to say to them, you know, try it. If you don't like it, it'll be gone in a couple weeks. That's right. easier than saying it'll be gone in three to four months, right? right? So right. Um, for those that are a little bit nervous, or if you have a patient even as an injector that you're nervous, I'm not sure if I feel comfortable injecting their right. frontalis, right. or will they like their crow's feet in yeah. pictures? We have something that they can try it's, to it's make sure it works for them, and then we can graduate to Botox, yeah. botulinum toxin it's type A to Botox. Almost like a trial run. It so. is. The other thing that I love about it, so they call it a test drive, by the way. It's a te yeah. test drive neurotoxin. That's funny. Um, the other thing that I really like about it is we've had so many patients come into our office, and they're like, oh, shoot, I forgot I have an event this weekend, and I need something to like make my right. you know, right. lines go away within a day. You know, yeah. So those who forgot to look on their calendar and plan accordingly, we have something that we can give them for an event that's the next day that'll work. That's so that's, yeah. that's a really wonderful thing to have in our toolbox. So it's there fast, and it's gone fast. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like uh, it's almost like a Cinderella bow tie, right? right? So, yeah. I think they might steal that from you. Oh, they, you got to put on me. <laughs> Allegan, if you're watching, that's, that belongs to me, Rob Kiskeo. Uh, that's great. So fantastic. Very yeah. exciting stuff. Really and there's exciting. other things there, but this is one of the things that, that's That's one of the coming. things that's coming. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great innovations coming for, from Allegan. What else is, is coming with botulinum toxin? So there's lots of things coming. There's What's so exciting about this industry is there's just so much innovation coming and super, super exciting. Um, so we have already FDA approved Daxify uh, from Revance, and that is sort of the opposite of Bonti, which is more of a long-acting uh, neurotoxin. So it's botulinum toxin type A. It's also a naked protein, so it doesn't have um, a protein attached to it, sort of like Xeomin. Um, and it also has this um, proprietary peptide that, um, the, that they claim, and, and the thought is it kind of um, hangs around that neuromuscular junction a little longer, so more of that extra toxin can kind of have a chance to penetrate and give us a six to nine month indication. So this is wow. wonderful. Okay. I think will fit in our practices for those toxin fatigue patients um, that you know how to inject them. You've been injecting them for years. They're sick of having to come back every three months to give them more of a longevity. And um, I'm also interested to see in our hands once it's on the market. Um, how this will play for those who have a little bit of a resistance um, to, to the other products that we have and see if maybe they have, um, you know, our non-responders have a little bit of a better response to this, um, to this type of, of uh, toxin. So right. there is some thought there that it might help 
So that's yeah. so we have a short acting one. We have a yeah. really long acting one. Mm -hmm. okay, and there's great. no HSA um, with with Daxify as well. So that's the thought. So I think you know we got to see. You know, it's it, although it's FDA approved, it's not yet in our hands. So okay. um, hoping within the next month or so, we'll we'll be able to we'll really. Be it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's great. But it's really exciting. And then they also have another one by Allergan, which is um, going to be a botulinum toxin type A X. So on a botulinum toxin type A X, um, and that X we don't really know what it is. It's proprietary, but they're saying it's similar that it's going to have lo more longevity. So that's in the works as well. Okay. Um, and then we also have um, pre-filled um, uh, syringes coming down the pipeline. We also have um, uh, different neurotoxins that are al already. Um, reconstituted for us, so you don't have to deal with the math and reconstituting. You're just like in the vial and you can just draw it out ready to go, or whether they're going to be in the syringes and ready to go. So, so many things are coming and it's really exciting. That's great. Yeah. Well, that's an awesome uh, view of uh, the current state of, yeah. of botulinum <laughs> and some great practical tips in terms of clinical treatment. So, we're going to take a uh, another, we're going to do another segment and talk sure. a little bit b about filler in detail, but this is a great start. Okay. So thanks for hanging around and hang around a little bit longer. We'll talk about filler. My pleasure. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Bye, thanks guys. for watching. Thanks for watching the segment. Uh, Dermcast TV, Rob Cascale with Ely Samuels. You can find her at Lip Lady of Miami uh, on Instagram.